Hi, I'm happy to be here today to talk about the state of the climate report in 20, that we just released a couple of weeks ago actually for 2020. And my name's Dr Lynette Bedio and I'm from the Bureau of Meteorology and this is a report that we release every two years with our colleagues at CSIRO. So why do we release this report? This, is, this report is probably one of the reports that, that the Australian community gets to see it gets to see that information that, that draws on the latest climate monitoring and science and projection information to really um, describe those long-term changes that we're seeing in our climate and that's impacting on the community. And we know we're experiencing climate change now and it's really impacting on our community now. So the summer that we've just seen and that's, I suppose that's some of the impacts that we're going to continue to see into the, into the future. And it's really important to get this information out to the public, out to those people, the community that needs to make those decisions around what, what we need to do to, um, to adapt to those further changes. We saw in 2019 how that it, these changes will impact on a lot of a lot of communities, a lot of Australia, and I think people are hungry for this information, but this is, I suppose, a general overview, uh, a communication tool um, to communicate with some of the um, some of these some of these communities. And you know, we will advise people to go to that more specific localized information for to get that to get such as again the Victorian 2019 projections to get you know that information for their more local area. So we often get the question what in this report has surprised you? Well I suppose there's there's no surprises. This this warming trend, these changes that we've seen throughout a number of the reports, we release this report every two years and this is the sixth report in the series, those trends are continuing. The science is getting stronger and we're seeing more and more of those impacts. So the warming trend that we saw in previous reports is continuing. And why is this important? It's important because it leads to that increase in extreme events. It's not just the average that we're concerned about, it's the impact that that has on our extremes, on those heat extremes, on those bushfire extremes that we saw over summer. So with that warming trend, there's been an increase in extreme heat events and there's been an increase in that extreme, in that uh, dangerous bushfire weather with an earlier start to the bushfire season seen in many areas and an increase in the intensity of that bushfire weather, especially across parts of southern Australia. I think this is just, this is something that people have been working on for a while now, but we're starting to see we, we're seeing starting to see some of those impacts play out more. So we are seeing more of those examples, more of that data coming through, but also that science. Um, say, you know, what we saw come out in the Bushfire Royal Commission and after 2019, 2020 summer, a lot more say that science around bushfires, around um, those maybe those weather systems, those um, generated from bushfires and more, so perhaps more that specific science. Whereas, um, yeah, whereas before I think, you know, it might have been more, oh, you know, looking at, at, oh, Australia is warming and doing science around that. As that continues, just really drilling down into those impacts, the science around how exactly is it going to impact, what what has it exactly has it impacted, what has changed. As we know, Australia's climate is highly variable. We've got those El Nino, those ENSO years acting. So we can see on the graph here, we can see we can see it wiggling up and down. But I just want to point out. So we can see those cooler years with the La Nina event that we had around 2010, 2011, and Australia's warmest year on record last year, 2019. But I just want to point out, though we do have this large variability, it's that variability is happening on a trend. So we can see we can see that up and down, but we could also see a definite trend there. So those cooler years that are happening now, and a war as warm or nearly as warm as some of those extreme warm years we saw in the earlier parts of the record, whilst those warm years that we're seeing now on top of that trend are, are really uh, 
are greater than anything we've seen in, in the past record of Australia's temperature. And what is driving this? Well, it's, it's no surprise that it's driven by the increase of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere from human sources, from that burning of fossil fuels. So what we see here is, the, is a graph of uh, CO2 concentrations going back into the past. And we can see that the CO, current levels of CO2 are greater than what we've seen in the past at least 800,000 years and past 2 million years. But what I want you to really look at with this graph is just those boxes, that rate of change. So up until last century, the rate of CO2 rise was up to 10 parts per million per century. But what we're seeing now, the current rate of CO2 rise is increasing at two to three parts per million, not per century, but per year. And that's a huge rapid change. So whereas before with that gradual rise, with that gradual rate of change, the systems, the environment could slowly adapt to that, could what we're seeing now is we have that we have less capacity to adapt with that sudden rate of change. We're putting a sudden shock into the system and we're we're wanting our systems to adapt and they're just not built to adapt to that that sudden rate of change. And we're seeing that the impacts from that in those extremes. Now, we saw that the temperatures were warming and we talked about how that average is warming, but the variability still happens on top of that average. And this is a really nice graph here that I like to talk to to explain this concept. So we have three curves and you can think of those curves as the average here and with most of the action happening around the average, around the middle. And I like to say sometimes if we lined up all the people in the room, but we can't do that at the moment in this current environment. So if we lined up all the people virtually, we'd see some people that were shorter than usual, most about average and some people really very much taller. Then if we shifted that average, if everybody stood on their chair or stood on a book, we would we'd see fewer short people and more of those really tall people and more people would now be in that very tall category. So that's what we're seeing with these temperatures. That average, just that shift of the average of around one degree from the period 1960 to 1989 to the period 2005 to 2019 has been enough to shift what we see in those extreme um, warm monthly temperatures. So we can see with just a little bit of a shift in the curve in the middle, we went from 2% of the time, those very warm monthly temperatures that we used to see 2% of the time, to temperatures that we saw 4% of the time. But we can see that's not linear. We just a little bit more, we're now seeing those very warm monthly temperatures that we only used to see nearly 2% of the time, now seeing over 12% of the time. So that's a huge change. And you can imagine when we shift these curves even a little bit further to, to the, to the right-hand side there, how much of that graph is going to be under those, those ex, that extreme, how much of that is going to be at that to a standard deviations line. So very much more likely to see those extreme monthly temperatures now. And cooler temperatures are less likely to occur. And that's also illustrated here in the daily, daily temperature um, extremes. So when that's compared to the, the, month, the climatology of the month that it's in, we're looking at the top 1% of days. And we can see that a lot of that top 1%, 43, occurred in 2019. That's, two, that's 43 of those very warm days. And we can also see this across thresholds as well if we look at say days above 39 and this represents we can see this this is happening all across Australia at every every station so this represents uh, very warm conditions across a lot of the country and these trends as we, we're seeing across all of the country and of course it's not just about temperature it's we're changing our rainfall patterns as well, our weather systems. So shown here is the cool season rainfall, April to October rainfall for Australia. 
and with parts of northern Australia faded out there because it's their dry season, so they don't really have much rainfall during this time. But for southern Australia, it's a really important time for agriculture and for really recharging those water resources, those dams, filling up those dams, filling and growing those, those getting that soil moisture wet. And just looking at the last 20 years here compared to uh, the, the rest of the other 20 year periods on record starting from 1900. We know, again, very, rainfall is very variable across Australia, but when we look at the last 20 years, we can see that large parts of Southern Australia are very much below average rainfall, that bottom 10% of such periods on record, or the lowest, uh, lowest on record for those last 20 years. So what we're seeing, what uh, physically has happened, we're seeing those that shift in the weather systems with those frontal rainfall systems that used to always be that reliable um, widespread rainfall shifting further south and not impacting on the continent as much. Now, Southwest WA mainly gets its rainfall from those, those systems during this time of the year. And we first started to see this in the 1970s with WA, which I'll talk to later. Southeast Australia can get rainfall from other sources as well. So we didn't see this, this trend as, 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 as early as what we did in Southwest Western Australia. But it's a definite trend towards lower rainfall conditions across southern parts of the country that will need to be managed for into the future. We see a really important role um, at the Bureau in monitoring the changes that we've already seen. So monitoring those impacts. If it was a few dry years, you know, we wouldn't be investing billions in desalination plants. So it's really, um, really important to actually monitor those changes that they've made and also to look at those changes and say, is this just natural variability? Is it going to switch back? Or is this due to some outside force, you know, such as we might see drought in Australia? Is this due to El Nino? Is this due to the Indian Ocean dipole? Or is it something else? So like we do like we do that with the system with climate change. Is are these changes, are these trends that we're seeing, are they due to climate change? Is this going to continue? Is this, going to, is this going to be something that we're going to have to adapt to and deal with? And I think probably for me that's a really important point um, of the report. Probably this report is more backward-looking, um, sort of touching on projections, but backward-looking in, in the way saying, hey, we have these, seen these changes, it is climate change, so they're going to continue into the future and you're going to have to adapt to them. Looking again at the rainfall here for Southeast Australia, and as I said, uh, there is huge, there's large variability again with those really wet years, those really dry years, dry periods earlier on in the record. But what we're seeing now is we're seeing less of those really wet years, those recharge years. So you remember during the millennium drought, that was a real feature of that millennium drought, those dry years, and not as many of those wet years. But Aside from, uh, then we had the La Nina, two big La Nina events, 2010, 2011, which brought some of those wetter conditions, a negative, very strong negative Indian Ocean dipole in 2016, again wetter. But aside from that, we're not seeing those, those really um, large recharge years. Average, below average, but not that very much above average. And we're seeing this in southwest uh, Western Australia as well, and again, since probably the mid-1970s, that tendency towards drier than average conditions without those real recharge conditions that we saw in those earlier parts of the record. And the Bureau and CIRA have done a lot of work on this, you know, back back in the late 1990s, it was, you know, is this is this going to continue? What will we need to change to to accommodate for this? And so now there's, there's a lot of independent independent from rainfall water uh, sources in southwest WA such as desal and across other parts of Australia such as desalination plants and groundwater use. So WA won't run out of water like we've seen in some other parts of the world. So the Indian Ocean Dipole, I suppose given the name, it's in the Indian Ocean. It's a bit similar to what we see in the Pacific Ocean with, with the ENSO cycle. So in the Pacific Ocean with the ENSO cycle, 
when you have, say, that have those cooler temperatures or uh, in the eastern Pacific Ocean, you have those warmer temperatures near Australia, that's a La Nina event. Those warmer temperatures near Australia really drive that moisture uh, circulation, uh, make that moisture available for Australia. Um, in the Indian Ocean, when you have those warmer sea surface temperatures near Australia and those cooler sea surface temperatures near Africa, that it's a similar, it's a negative Indian Ocean dipole event and really drives that, um, that moisture again across Australia. So looking at rainfall here and northern Australia as well, and very high variability, so not as we can't be as clear on the trends there in northern Australia, but there has been a tendency towards wetter than average conditions in recent years, aside from the last two dry, wet seasons. We do see it year round, but year round totals in, in the dry season in the north might mean you just get a few millimetres more than, you know, your normal zero millimetres or no, not quite that much. But yeah, so it's mainly it's mainly during the wet season that we're seeing that. And the the issue I suppose with northern Australia is that it's just you see those huge totals. So it's really highly variable when you get a, a dry wet season like we saw for the last two years. Um, it can it can really impact on the water resources. So um, I suppose, for example, some of the water storages in uh, in northern Australia, they go to 100% every year. We, I mean, that's something that we don't see in southern Australia. <laughs> but uh, with those storages, and when they do have a couple of dry couple of dry seasons, uh, like we've seen recently, we're starting to see those storages um, actually not go to 100%. They're, they're starting to decrease because you know, they have to last over the dry season. So, they're, you know, so parts of northern Australia are really looking for those um, for that for a big wet season. Hopefully, um, this year to to increase some of those water storages. With those warmer temperatures and those drier conditions that we're seeing, we're seeing that increase in bushfire weather. So increase in the number of days with dangerous weather conditions for bushfires, especially across uh, southern Australia and southeastern Australia, based on an index of bushfire weather. So this isn't, I'll be clear, this isn't fires. We're not talking about the number of fires here. We're just talking about that potential. So if you had that ignition source for a fire, it, it, it's potent, there's potential to be severe. Um, with these with these sorts of weather conditions, but we have seen that increase in those weather conditions, that potential for bushfire, and we're seeing those starting earlier, and we're seeing them more intense, and that has a real implications for how we how we manage that with the sharing of resources between states, and also as with the sharing of resources globally. So we've we've seen this. We saw that play out in the last fire season with where we saw a huge amount of impact and a huge amount of um, resources needed to fight those devastating bushfires. And of course, it's not all about what's happening on our land, it's what's happening in our oceans as well. So just looking here, this is the global sea level rise and global sea level has risen by about 25 centimetres since 1880. Now, like one degree, 25 centimetres doesn't seem like a large number, but what we're seeing with that, with the extremes, we're, st we're seeing that increase in those inundation events with, um, and also impacting on erosion when you do have those extremes. And as the, that sea level does rise, as we're, as we're just adding that extra bit, we're going to have to adapt for that because just with that extra bit, we're going to see those inundation events. It's not going to take a big storm to see some of that inundation. In some areas, it could be just with that high tide. So, and with a lot of Australia living on the coast, this is, this is going to be a real issue as we go into the future. I also wanted to put the ocean heat content in here because of, um, yeah, cheers to ocean heat content because the earth is gaining heat Due to increases in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, most of this heat is being taken up by the oceans. So the, the oceans are doing a really big job of making sure that the impacts that we feel on land aren't quite as severe, but we're gonna, it's going to become more of a concern as they take up more and more of this energy. So more than 90% of the energy from the enhanced greenhouse effect is taken up by those oceans. 
that energy that's locked into the system means that we will see those impacts continue into the future. We will see that sea level rise and and with some of these um, we're seeing an increase in the rate so and that's that's true for sea level rise as well we're in seeing an increase in the rate of sea level rise so and you know to continue into the future and that does have all sorts of issues not just on the warming of our oceans but also with that take up of carbon dioxide the acidification of the oceans as well but it is a real issue as we start to see that heating up throughout the whole profile and, and what will, how will that impact on our oceans, on the currents, on the, on the marine life and systems. Acidification is a byproduct of the uptake of CO2, so it doesn't have as such an, an impact on the marine heat waves. It's the, it's the increased heat in the oceans that impact those marine, marine heat waves, but acidification can weaken um, uh, we can, uh, some, some would say some of the marine life, it can impact on coral reef systems and, um, and marine life that, you know, might need shells. <laughs> and so, yeah, so acidification has those sorts of, um, sorts of impacts. So those global average concentrations, just touching back on that, we're now seeing those levels uh, higher than what we've seen in in the last two million years. Oceans around Australia are acidifying and we've seen that around one degree rise in temperature. And similar to what we see on the land, that average rise in temperature can lead to an increased fre frequency of those marine heat waves that can really, again, impact like they do on land, impact on the land environment, they can really impact on the marine environment. And we've seen this through uh, issues such as coral bleaching, and uh, kelp forests, and we've seen this on, in marine life and changes in uh, where changes in species where spe uh, marine uh, species can live. And also with that rate of sea level rise, it varies around Australia, but it is in line with what's seen uh, globally with the globe those global trends, and it will impact on us into the future. So most of the report is about what we're seeing and it's, it's really important to let the community know what impacts we are experiencing, such as heat waves. Most of, you know, everyone has lived through a heat wave but they can, and they can have huge health impacts. And so this is something that we have to adapt for. And with some of those heat health plans in the state and some of the heat wave forecasts, uh, we're adapting to those. Uh, we're seeing less loss of life during heat waves, but this is something that we're going to have to adapt to further into the future with with many of these with many of these things. And before I get to I get to the end, I always you know have to t tack on because I feel like I've just been depressing people. I have to tack on, uh, but we're we're doing a lot of work and. But that's true. CSIRO and the Bureau are doing a lot of work around this how to, and working with all the state agencies who, uh, who are doing their own modelling, such as, um, such as in Victoria and all around Australia. People are starting to come together to work on this, which will, this problem, which is going to be, continue to be a, you know, just a very large um, issue for Australia. So, most of it is on what we have experienced, but in the report we, we touch on the projections and I will say please go to Climate Change in Australia or your um, local state projections to get more information on how this will affect you at your local level. But in general, Australia can expect to experience, um, we will increase in temperature and I'll talk to that in the next slide but heavy rainfall to become more intense. We might get less rainfall, but with the warmer atmosphere, when we do get rainfall, it, it is likely to be more intense. Marine heat waves, more frequent and intense sea level rise to continue. So a lot of those trends that we are seeing, thinking about how you have adapted to those, how you've, you know, what did you do in 2019? How have you adapted to that? And what are you gonna to have to do to adapt to that in the future? And it was with Royal Society of Victoria, actually, that we actually ran this future forum and a bit of a thought exercise because a lot of the time we, we think of, oh, what's it going to be like at 2030? So we think of that one year, we think of that severe, but think about what we've seen so, in, so far in, in 
rainfall and in heat, it's not just that one year. It's how are you going to manage all those years without that, without those really wet years in between. And if it gets even drier and it's forecast to get even drier than what it is now, how are you going to manage that? How are you going to manage those years with that increased bushfire risk when it comes when we don't have that long rest between those seasons? So looking at temperature, I just really wanted to put this in, um, and this is in the report, and we can also We've got it going out further if anyone wants to have a chat about that afterwards. Looking at the temperature of Australia, um, going up and down there again, um, as we discussed, but with that trend going through, with 2019, Australia's hottest and driest year on record, if we take that out, so we haven't, we've just got the projections here. So I suppose I should explain this graph a little bit more. This is all about the models. So the blue line is the observations and the black line is the mean of the observations. The grey line is what the models say would happen if we didn't have greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, if we just had those, those solar changes or that natural variability. And as you can see, we don't see the warming trend. That we see with that blue shading which is if you do include those greenhouse gases in the model. If we, we can only get that warming trend if we include those greenhouse gases in the model. So the yellow being what the models say will happen into the future. And usually you might have seen these with different scenarios like a um, business as usual scenario or a medium emission scenario that they might be called. But because of the ocean is doing such a great job of taking up all that extra energy and because of those long-lived greenhouse gases that are already in the atmosphere, we're going to continue all emission scenarios, even if we, even if we stop today, will continue along this path for the next uh, couple of decades. We don't start to see any divergence until until a couple of decades. And, and that's not to say, that's not to um, depress you and say that we don't need mitigation because the sooner we start taking action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we will see that divergence earlier and we will see a lessening of the impact. So with greater greenhouse gas emissions, we will see greater impacts. With less, I'll say it again the other way because it's an important point, with less greenhouse gas emissions, we will see fewer impacts and likely to be less intense. But just looking at this graph, so without even looking at possible divergence into the future, 2019, Australia's hottest and warmest year on record. And again, not just about the average, it's about those extremes that we saw during that year. Taking that across, that becomes around an average year in a couple of decades. So we will have to ha think about what you did during 2019. And again, don't think about what you're gonna to do two decades from now when that becomes an average year, but think about all the years in between. We, again, we're still gonna have climate variability. This year is not gonna be as as warm as 2019, though it's going to be pretty warm, but we're still, we're still going to have those ups and downs, but we will have to adapt to that changing climate that we see. And just, a, I suppose, a shout out here to the models that give us some of that picture about what we might need to have to change, have to change and have to adapt to. So the one on the left there from Victoria, from the Victorian 2019 um, projections, showing that Victoria is the projected range of rainfall. Um, this is what's actually happened and with a 20 year running average in there. And we can see that is generally happening in line with the projections, though, possibly at the drier end of those projections. So I will stop it there and I will reiterate, I suppose, my not good news, but there is an enormous amount of work going on at every level of government and many, many organisations to adapt to these, these future changes that we're going to see. And talking to my take home, I've, I've talked about variability, I've talked about those averages and I've talked about those extremes, but really uh, thinking about not in terms of averages, but in terms of extremes that really impact 
the environment and impact us. We, we don't really feel the averages as much. We feel those extremes. So thinking in terms of that and also thinking in terms of um, not what it's going to be like, you know, 2030, but what what it might be like, um, you know, if we if we don't if we do see that increased frequency. So thank you very much, and I'll stop it there. With this report, I suppose um, the changes that I've seen, um, I think Pete, there's much more acceptance of the um, of climate change. It's important that we know it's human induced because we know that um, we know why it's changing and that it will continue to change if we don't have those make those changes to our emissions. I just I suppose I want to stress though this this is actually there is a number of scientists that do uh, that do contribute to the writing of this report so it's not just me myself and my sorrow colleague it's it's we draw on the expertise of a number of scientists and the skills and the data and the science from both agencies. So there is a lot of, of, of work that goes into this report for, for such a, I suppose, I was, I was going to say a short document, but it's getting, it seems to be getting longer and longer every year. We managed to keep it at the same number of pages, but we crammed it in a little bit more. It's summarising what we're seeing. And there, of course, there's a lot more um, detail to be found if you go to places like such as climate change in Australia if you go to uh, your state the, the work done in your state such as the Victorian 2019 projections so there's a, there's a lot of work going on.